station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Military Times, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Military Times. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the space station. Thank you very much for having us today. Uh, Colonel Copra, it's been 30 years since you graduated from West Point. What would you tell the current uh, class of cadets about getting into a career in spaceflight? You know, that's a great question. You know, I don't think I quite envisioned that uh, I would have this job when I was a cadet many years ago. But uh, one of the great things about the West Point experience is that it's a great training ground for uh, not just military service and, uh, and the service I've had at, at NASA, but, but life as well, because it's a strong academic, uh, physical, and military preparation. And so uh, for the young people that are at uh, the academies, and particularly West Point, one thing to consider is that, uh, you know, in our job, it's very technical and it's very operational, and those are important things and important backgrounds to have. But at the end of the day, uh, what we do is very similar to the military in that it's a team sport, and uh, being able to work as a team is the most critical skill. For Captain Scott Kelly, you've been aboard the station for just about a year on the current expedition. How does that time in space compare to, say, a shipboard deployment? Yeah, it's uh, quite different. Um... I only I did one uh, like six month cruise on the uh, USS Dwight D Eisenhower and then uh, a shorter you know two to three month I think it was two months uh, on the George Washington a little shakedown cruise and the difference is on uh, you know on the aircraft carrier there with five thousand more than five thousand other people you have much more room you can go out on the flight deck get some fresh air. I was a pilot, so I got to fly off the ship. We went into port occasionally, not too much, but we did do that occasionally. Whereas here, um, you never leave. Um, it's a much more confined space, and um, but there are similarities. I mean, it's a very operationally oriented environment where, like Tim was saying, teamwork is uh, is very important. So. My experience on on those cruises and on the ships and you know, on the de deployment is uh, is great training for this, but it is uh, it is quite different in a lot of ways too. Two years ago, Military Times spoke with Terry Verts and Captain Butch uh, Wilmore about a future mission to Mars. Where do we stand toward that goal right now? Um, we have, uh, I think, a lot of the technical capability and a lot of, uh, you know, good understanding of what we need to do from a, uh, you know, physiological standpoint, risk mitigation. I mean, there's still certain things we need to learn. I think, you know, radiation is a, is a big factor. Um, but, you know, getting us to Mars, I think, is more about the, you know, public and, and political willpower to do so because um, even though it's something I think is uh, is quite worthy and uh, up for the expense and very important to us as a uh, you know as a species to can continue to expand our horizons it's something that's going to be expensive and uh, you know we need the uh, the support to do it so you know it's I think it's more of a matter of, uh, of choice than it is technical uh, feasibility. Tim, in your recent spacewalk, you had a malfunction of your spacesuit. Um, tell us what happened. Uh, was there any fear during that event, and how did you get through it? You know, I'm, I might have been the least worried person out of the whole team because, uh, you know, when you talk about water in a spacesuit, it sounds like a pretty uh, dramatic event. and. The things that, uh, that we've done because we've had this circumstance before in terms of risk mitigation 
and uh, the level of water that was in the helmet was such that I really never had a high level of concern. But I, I know that the whole team was uh, was very concerned about the circumstance. One of the the, the, um, the interesting parts of, of the whole experience was the fact that uh, since we've had this problem before, we've instituted some methodologies in, in terms of how we get people back inside quickly and the things we have in the suit that can help protect us. So, um, you know, I was never actually very concerned because I knew we had uh, lots of margin in time. And uh, I was so impressed with how both the uh, the ground team and uh, and how my compatriot Tim Peak outside handled the whole circumstance. So uh, I think it turned out well. I think hopefully we'll understand better what exactly led to the water in the helmet. But at the end of the day, uh, we got our mission done and uh, we had some risk mitigation in place to help out. Today is the 30th anniversary of the shuttle Challenger explosion. Uh, can you, gentlemen, give me your thoughts uh, on the events of that day? Yeah, I was in uh, college in, uh, in 1986, and I was going to class, and it was lunchtime, and I typically would watch the space shuttle launches, and I, um, you know, saw what happened and, you know, immediately, um, you know, pretty much knew that it was a, you know, catastrophic accident. And uh, I didn't know the crew members uh, of Challenger, obviously, because I was in college at the time. But uh, it was quite a, uh, you know, a moving um, and emotional experience. Uh, you know, for me, as growing up, astronauts were, were my heroes. And uh, it was, um, you know, tough to see them lost like that on on a on a space flight on national television and uh i feel uh you know honored and privileged to you know follow in their footsteps and i think that uh you know what we do in space now is uh, you know fulfilling their their dream and carrying on their legacy and i think uh you know we need to just keep pushing ahead and then you know trying to achieve great things and, uh, you know, on days like today, think back to, to what they sacrificed. Tim, a few years ago uh, we spoke, and you weren't sure whether at the end of the space shuttle program you would stick with the program. What made you stay with space flight? You know, I think all of us that have experienced space flight or even uh, those that are in the astronaut corps that are looking forward to that have a true passion for this kind of work. And uh, both the, the passion for the, the type of work we do, but the people that we work with is one that is really hard to, to replace or to, uh, to, to duplicate. And so, you know, having uh, flown once and then uh, uh, having a delay in order to get back to flight you know, to me, I think probably the main reason I decided to, to try for another flight was just the fact that I love the people that I work with, uh, I love the mission, and uh, I think it's very, very important, both nationally and internationally. On Earth, there's competition between nations in the Arctic, in the South China Sea, throughout the globe. What makes space so different that there is this spirit of cooperation between nations in technology and in exploration? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, a few things. Um, you know, it's a common ground that uh, no one has claim over. I think that's, uh, you know, one aspect of it, whereas on Earth, you know, people, you know, stick a flag in the, in the dirt sometimes and say it's theirs and try to... Uh, and, and do, and rightfully so, I guess in some cases, you know, you, you defend your territory and protect uh, your interests. But, but here it's, uh, you know, been well established and it's, uh, you know, an international agreement that this is, this is a, a, a place for the common um, good and cooperation. And it's, uh, it's complicated and it's expensive. And international cooperation not only uh, 
you know, helps in, in, in those two areas, but it also uh, provides redundancy, uh, redundancy in systems. The space station has a lot of uh, redundancy because, you know, very, the majority of it was made in either the, uh, you know, in the U.S. or European nations or Russia, or Russia, you know, we have different ways of scrubbing carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. We have different ways of supplying the space station with redundant systems. And it's uh, you know critical that all that that stuff works. And if something breaks, it's great to have a backup. And uh, you know I think that's one of been one of the uh, the great parts about the space station program is that we're working on something that's very important. It's very uh, difficult and challenging, and and we're doing it in a uh, international way that shows that we can you know cooperate even when at times we may may have our differences on Earth. Well, I want to thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us. One last thought. Uh, are you two going to be staying with the program after this? So um, I'm at 10% uh, remaining on this year in space. And uh, to me, uh, that seems like I still have a long ways to go. And uh, so I haven't really given it... Uh, an incredible amount of thought. Certainly, uh, I have given it some thought, but not, uh, you know, not what I would be, uh, I guess, willing to share uh, with you today. But uh, appreciate the question. I guess uh, all I can add to that is that my horizon right now is about uh, four and a half months. We have a ton of work to do here between now and the 5th of June when we come back home. And so uh, I think we'll focus on the immediate future and look what happens after that once I get back home. And have a very safe trip home. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Military Times interview. Thank you, Military Times. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications.